Finnovate showcases cutting-edge banking and financial technology through a global conference series featuring short-form demos and thought leadership. Now, the conversation continues on the Finnovate podcast. Welcome to the Finnovate Podcast. Joining me today, we have Allison Harwood, the head of the London branch of Varengold Bank. Allison, thank you for joining me on the show. Can you start by just giving our audience a quick introduction to who you are and who Varengold Bank is? Yes. So as you said, I'm head of the London branch for Varengold Bank. We are a German-based bank headquartered in Hamburg, and we provide financing and fronting to solutions to fintech lenders across Europe. That's really interesting. It's obviously something that's a hot topic right now. Um, but let's start with kind of some basic questions. So you're based in, in Germany. Obviously, you're pr- personally based in London. What geographies is Varengold currently engaging with? So we're, we're pan-European. We can cover all of continental Europe. And we also have a branch in Bulgaria in Sofia to cover the uh, CEE region. So it's interesting, Finnovate has just moved our European show to Berlin because of some of the really exciting fintech pieces that are happening, not just in the UK, but across Europe and into Eastern Europe as well. So um, nice to have that kind of validated a little bit, that decision validated. We made our first foray into Berlin here this past February, which was really interesting. And we are going back there again. Well, circumstances permitting, we're going back there in early 2021. But let's talk a little bit about the portfolios of loans that you're seeing originated by fintech lenders. You know, how are those performing? What are you seeing on that front? Yeah, so we like to partner with fintech lenders to try and increase access to financing for the underbanked and to promote technological advances and digitization in financial services. We have the the benefit of operating across jurisdictions within Europe. So we get to see a huge array of of different lending models and different approaches. But I think the overriding theme that, that we see from the fintech lending industry is that the digitization of traditionally manual processes can really effectively work to create safe and and profitable portfolios of of loans. And and that's not just on powering better risk-adjusted scoring models using more data points than you would see usually and in a more efficient way, but it's also in originating in a more effective manner at a lower cost and also on on the back end distributing the loans in a more cost effective way so we we really think that fintech lenders have so much to to offer that, that their growth has been incredible so far but we think there's a lot more to come absolutely agreed on that front i think one of the things you just kind of highlighted there there's sort of two primary camps for fintechs who are in this space. One of them says, you know, the basic theory is I can lend to people who have traditionally been excluded by the financial system so far, yet they still are a good bet from a credit standpoint. You know, there's low risk of engaging Mm -hmm. with them and we have increased data that allows us to lend to them with confidence. The other camp is basically, you know, we're going to lend to people who have traditionally been able to be a part of the uh, financial system, who've been able to get credit, but we're going to do it in a more efficient way. We're going to reduce barriers to you know, loan origination, basically just kind of streamline and techify the process. And yeah. you know, has there been a difference that you guys have seen so far between those two groups in terms of the results, you know, the strength of the portfolio that those kinds of companies are able to create? Um, I I think what we've seen is that they are creating very effective portfolios. You're not not only able to increase access to financing, just like you say, for people who you now are able to make a safe bet on, but for those who haven't been traditionally excluded from financial services, you can price loans better and give people better options and give them a better customer experience as well. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we've seen, you know, on the Finnovate stage, certainly we've seen companies who have been making this claim for many years now who said, you know, we are able to do better in these key areas. We're able to get money in the hands of people who can use it. Uh, we, we can do that more efficiently. We can do that with a greater understanding of the actual risk of default. And so it's really great to hear that a lot of the, those theories are being borne out by the data. That, and, and I think that's something that's really positive for the industry. So, you know, for, for banks, who are hesitant to engage with this space because they thought this is a little bit too risky. Now there's going to start to be some data which says, actually, you know what? It's depending on who your fintech is, of course, who's actually out there. You need to do your due diligence on that side. But assuming you do that, there are opportunities there for banks to engage across geographies outside of where they are. So, you know, for banks in the US, obviously a little bit of a different story than what is happening in Europe, but there still are the same kinds of opportunities for banks to engage with fintechs and, and to to provide a, a partner for them to allow them to lend money in, in this efficient, effective way that, that does create strong portfolios. So, so far, everything we've been talking about is kind of you know, uh, the same as the situation as it would have been back in February of, of this year. Obviously, there's been a huge amount of transitions and interesting surprises for us all so far in 2020. Um, and, and you guys have actually been doing some really strong work with various governments as a response to COVID-19. Can you talk a little bit about some of the pieces that you're doing on those government-backed loans um, for small businesses and other consumers? Yeah, sure. So one of the uh, great opportunities that we have seen as an organization is that in this moment of crisis, governments are stepping up to bridge the liquidity gap that that SMEs would otherwise be seeing with underwriting of of loans. Uh, And we've been actively working with a couple of governments to help facilitate the access to fintech lenders to those programs and and provide liquidity that the fintech lenders need to be able to get money out of the door to their customers under those programs. So, of course, being um, a German bank, the, the KFW in Germany, which is the state development bank there, we recently got accredited to act as a house bank under their coronavirus um, SME loans program. Um, And we're partnering with fintech lenders in Germany to make sure that they can access that scheme, which is only available via a house bank. Okay. Wow. No, that, that's a big deal. And um, I also saw a press release uh, that you guys just put out around some work you're doing with Capilendo. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so, so Capilendo are, are the first fintech lender under that program. And we're, we're acting as their house bank to allow their customers to access the KFW's Schnell Credit, which is a 100% uh, government underwritten loan for SMEs in Germany. Very cool. No, that's a that's a great program, and I wish you and Capilendo all the success in the world around that. Because if there again, it's about establishing a model, showing that this is something that can work well. So, I, and it sounds like things are off to a good start. Let's let's shift gears a little bit now and talk about this from the fintech side, because you know, this is a difficult decision for fintech founders. You know, first off, do I need to find a partner bank? Or can I try and go and become a challenger bank is, is kind of the first question. And then the second piece is, if I do decide that I need a banking partner, which is probably the, more likely than not, how do I go about picking that partner? So I think the, it'd be really helpful to get your thoughts um, on what, what fintechs really should be aware of, the questions they should be asking both themselves and potential partners in order to make it a successful partnership all around. Yeah, so, so there are two ways that we partner with fintech lenders. One is to provide them with financing to grow loan portfolios. And we're typically partnering with them at a a relatively early stage in their development where they have a proven credit model and they've got some track record under their belt that that shows that the business works and it's effective and, and can be profitable but they need um, an institutional partner to come in and help them grow their their portfolios up to the next level where they could maybe then access the deeper pockets of of institutional money or the capital markets. That's one way that we're helping fintech lenders. The other way is through providing them with a fronting service where we can offer the ability to operate within our regulatory umbrella and use our our license to be able to lend in the highly regulated markets within Europe. 
And we can also offer the, the products that our back and middle office functions as a bank can offer on a, on a modular basis. So, uh, and we can do the two together. So typically we might find a, a lender who is operating under a specific license in one jurisdiction or doesn't need a license in one jurisdiction, but to enter into a new market, they need a different license that might take quite a long time to obtain. So that's where they can really benefit from a fronting partner to get them off the ground very quickly. Sure. No, makes sense. So we're almost out of time and I'm going to give you a really difficult task right now because this is going to be a monster question and not very much time left to answer it. But here we go. Where do we go from here? What does the fintech lending space look like You know, 12 months from now? Obviously, a lot of uncertainty going on. So this is sort of a, a best guess. And really, you've only got about 45 seconds. <laughs> Okay, I'll keep it quick. I think there will be some winners and some losers. I think there will be the credit models that are really proven to to be substantive during this time. And those businesses will really benefit greatly from the increased acceleration to digitization that the coronavirus crisis has presented us with. So hopefully more winners than losers. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I think that's certainly one of the positives that will come out of all of this is that we are going to get that kind of data, which we haven't had before around, you know, really what works here, what doesn't. And, and hopefully we're able to build something which can take the industry forward and come up with some best practices and things like that to really help people follow a path, you know, say, this is a well-established route. You can do this and be successful. And here's the data that proves it. And I think that'll be a really powerful place to get to. So, um, well, Allison, thank you again for taking time out to join me and chat with me. This has been very educational and appreciate your time. Thanks, Greg. Pleasure. The Finnovate podcast is produced by Informa Connect in association with Provoke.fm Media. Check out Finnovate.com for information on Finnovate's upcoming shows and to learn how you can get involved. The discount code Finnovate Podcast will save you 20% on tickets to all of our events. And you can email us at info at for information on sponsoring, speaking, or demoing. Thanks for listening. <laughs>